Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, an update on family separations at the southern border. A full report on what happened in court today and how many asylum-seeking parents remain apart from their children. Plus, the number of seniors living on the streets is growing. What's causing the increase? A push to designate City Heights as a cultural destination, the community's progress so far. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. It's Thursday, April 25th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. Six months, that's how long a San Diego federal judge is giving the U.S. government to identify potentially thousands of children who are separated from their parents at the border. KPBS border reporter Jean Guerrero was at the hearing. Commander Jonathan White of the Department of Health and Human Services was in the courtroom today testifying. He's the official who designed the original plan to reunify thousands of children who were separated from their parents and who's currently designing the new plan to reunify potentially thousands more who remain separated. Despite the U.S. government's attorneys saying that they need more time to identify the remaining families, Commander White said he actually thinks that it will be possible to identify these remaining families within a six-month period. The judge called him a beacon of light in this process and said he has the utmost confidence in him. And he decided to issue the order for the identification to be done within six months, subject to good cause. Here's what Attorney Lee learned of the ACLU had to say. We could not be happier with the way it went today in court. We have an enormous task ahead of us now to try and find all these families. In addition to establishing the six-month deadline, the judge also asked that Commander White participate in regular status update phone calls about the process. Reporting from the federal courthouse, Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Commander White says the child detention facilities in the U.S. are currently 97 percent occupied. Then Social Security checks, a little retirement savings and a lack of affordable housing are forcing some California seniors onto the streets. In San Diego County, the number of people on the streets between the ages of 55 and 74 grew by 6 percent last year. As part of our Grain California series, KPBS's Amitha Sharma spent the day with a 71 year old man who lives on San Diego's sidewalks. This is where I sleep. And usually I start getting ready to go to sleep about 8.30 at night. After a night and, uh, sitting up I, uh, against the front of San Diego uh, Senior uh, Wellness uh, Center, he's stiff. And this is my problem right here, trying to get up with two bad knees. I had two surgeries, two knees replacing two hips, and being cold all night doesn't help it. He says he spends most of the night winking and blinking. Can't sleep solid because I don't want to get my throat cut. I lost a friend out here who got stabbed to death. He points to his cane, his only defense. Stick. Then he walks eight blocks through and other you know, homeless encampments to a nearby oh, deli oh, to use the bathroom. Sammy, remember I told you that movie I was making? Okay. Carl I seems know, to know everybody know, here. He's in his element. And this is, a, this is a nice guy. He feeds me, he gives me a cup of coffee. Hey, let me put a lobby when I got a dollar. <laughs> Most days, he gets on the bus. It comes my 215. You want to see me? So you're getting on the bus now. What are you going to do? Usually I get on the bus, I go to sleep. He takes the bus back to the Senior Wellness Center for lunch. This is how it goes, except on Saturdays and Sundays. Afterwards, he shares his deepest wish. And I feel better inside of a place where I got a key where I can lock myself in at night. I don't like laying out in the street like that. And when it rained those, uh, that last week, oh man, it was rough. Carl says he wound up on the streets after the death of his second wife. He says he got booted from Section 8 housing for subletting to a felon. And I didn't read the small print. I became homeless as of August 26, 2015. Carl says he keeps trying to find a new place, but there are few options in California for relatively healthy homeless seniors. Then I find out you got to be cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs to get in there. I'm not going to play crazy. I'm, I'm not crazy. I'm broke. I'm homeless. There are days, he says, when this existence is overwhelming. I've been up and down, but mostly up. I was explaining that when the weather's nice, my pain is not that bad. But when it's cold outside, I'm cold. And I've been living on the streets out here in front of this building a while. Money does not stretch. There were days when you only get 800, 
He says he knows other homeless seniors who've killed themselves out of desperation. You commit suicide? That's a coward's way out. Carl is optimistic. He's working with a pro bono lawyer to try to convince the Teamsters Union he's entitled to a pension from his truck driving days. Meanwhile, he says he trudges along. My plans are to continue to pray and hope. On this day, senior wellness center worker Tim Ruiz hands Russell a bag of food and new clothing and encouragement. Stay in there, Carl. Don't give up. I can't. My mother had 13 kids. I'm second to the oldest. Mama taught us how to survive. Amitha Sharma. Thank you. I'll see you later. Take care. KPBS thank News. Ngawa. This story is part of our statewide California Dream collaboration. You'll find more stories at kpbs.org slash dream. Flu cases decline for the fourth straight week, but the death toll rises to 67. According to county health officials, three more people died from the flu last week. They were between the ages of 55 and 96, all had pre-existing medical conditions. At this time last year, there were more than 300 flu deaths. Also, there have been 9,000 flu cases this season compared to 20,000 last year. While flu cases continue to drop, influenza is still making people sick. Officials urge everyone older than six months old to get vaccinated. Students from USC have been working in City Heights to see if the community can be awarded a California Cultural District certification. KPBS reporter Priya Shreether tells us what it takes. When you walk around City Heights, it's clear that the neighborhood is vibrant, full of diversity and culture, food and art. And that's why local leaders here think it's time their community gets a California Cultural District certification from the California Arts Council. Our primary interest is from an economic development perspective for um, branding and, re and recognition. Um, additionally, we're really interested in the preservation elements that um, could be leveraged from that so that we can preserve our culture. and. Um, you know, avoid the, the common issue of uh, displacement of arts and culture as areas grow and uh, become more affluent. And that's what a designation would give an area. Official state certification, branding materials, and $5,000 a year for a period of five years. The California Arts Council says it wants districts to play a conscious role in tackling the issue of artist displacement. In 2017, the California Arts Council gave three awards in San Diego to Balboa Park, Oceanside and Barrio Logan. This year, master's students from the University of Southern California's School of Public Policy came to City Heights to study four possible areas that might be worthy of a designation. Because the California Cultural District has to be walkable, we identified four different nexuses within City Heights that could, could provide that space. So they're short, uh, less than a mile, five minute districts that uh, we, could, we could say, you know, visitors could come and they could walk from one end to another and experience City Heights within this space. But hopefully that district would be then leveraged to benefit the entire community at large. They looked at walkability and streetscapes and community assets like schools, religious organizations and restaurants and retailers. Ultimately, they found that Little Saigon had the most potential to be awarded a designation right now. But they also felt that it might be worth it for City Heights to wait to apply for the designation. So we feel like it's a little premature to pursue this cultural district designation, especially when there's all these infrastructure things that need to be made, uh, things that improve walkability like street lighting or uh, sidewalks, improvements, things like that, even public art. Um, so there's a lot of things that we wanted to suggest for City Heights. City Heights leaders say they haven't decided what to do with the recommendations just yet. They think going through the application process could be valuable even if they aren't awarded the designation this year. It's very informative, um, really nice to have an outside perspective of, of somebody else um, looking in. We, uh, we're all a little too entrenched and, and we think we're a perfect candidate. Um, but it's interesting to hear the perspective of, of uh, an outside point of view. Both City Heights leaders and students agree that preserving the community's unique diversity of refugees, immigrants, and a blending of cultures, especially in the face of gentrification, should be a priority. People were uh, incredibly happy to talk to us, incredibly proud of where they've come from, really willing to tell the stories of how their families came here and what it looked like to start a business or even just to put food in their families' mouths, to send their kids to college. 
Um, so that was was really impressive and uh, super. It's a delight to see, honestly, when you do this kind of work, um, just to see a community that has such a strong sense of, of who it is. Priya Shreether, KPBS News. The California Arts Council will release applications later this year. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the NewsHour, former Vice President Joe Biden jumps into the race for the 2020 Democratic presidential nomination. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. Former Vice President Joe Biden officially throws his hat into the race for the 2020 presidential election. But what are his chances? Kelly Daschle from the Associated Press breaks it down. Ending months of speculation, former Vice President Joe Biden is making it official, formally declaring his bid for the White House, joining an already crowded and diverse Democratic field. Though his announcement is hardly a surprise, I appreciate the energy you showed when I got up here. Save it a little longer. I may need it in a few weeks. Biden's formal declaration finally resolves the last big open question about the field and propels him instantly to the front of the pack in the early polls. But Biden's campaign hit a major stumble before it began, rocked by controversy in recent weeks over allegations of inappropriate, albeit non-sexual, interactions with a number of women. Biden denies any improper contact, but says he gets that Thank social you. norms are shifting. I hear what they're saying. I understand it. And I'll be much more mindful. That's my responsibility. Still, analysts say the controversy highlights what could be his biggest challenge in the race, navigating the current generational shift going on in the Democratic Party. We are a diverse country. The Democrats will be mounting a younger and more diverse candidate pool than we've seen recently. And his demographics, age, gender, uh, and race, don't match up very well with the diversity of the rest of the pool. The former vice president enters the race as a moderate establishment candidate in a field dominated by those battling to be the progressive standard bearer. This will be the 76-year-old Biden's third run for the White House, and critics say he'll face an uphill battle attracting new voters and a party longing for an energetic, fresh face. But Biden's supporters argue his foreign policy chops, the working-class Rust Belt appeal, and his candor, ironically something that has plagued him in the past, give him a leg up on most of the others in the field. One of the big advantages of uh, a Biden candidacy is that he has a great common touch. He knows how to speak to uh, the average citizen in, in a language and on the themes that they're interested in. And those supporters believe he's exactly what the party needs to win against Trump. All right. Kelly Daschle, Associated Press. Other candidates running against Biden include Senator Bernie Sanders, Senator Kamala Harris, and Senator Elizabeth Warren. There's a national debate over some symbols in their controversial histories. One of those debates is over the state flag of Massachusetts. WGBH reporter Arun Roth shows us why critics want it to change. The state flag is everywhere, but have you ever really looked at it? I'm sure I've seen it every day and walked right by it, but for whatever reason, it's never registered. I gotta be honest, I kinda like it. Yeah. I'm assuming the gentleman in the shield, is that's that it, that's Native It's yeah. easy to miss okay. one that little detail. Right? A sword just, uh, hanging over the head of that Native American. That disembodied arm you see there with that's with a, a little dis yeah, it's a little troubling. Now that I see it, it's as bold as you know, it's as bold as day. It's very clear. You've got the Native man here, and he's supposed to represent Usamequin. Hartman Deeds is a Wampanoag who learned this history as a kid. Usamequin is uh, the person that history remembers as Massasoit, who signed the peace treaty with the English folks in 1621, known as the 1621 Agreement. And this is what they often remember in the first Thanksgiving. Now, that sword over Usamequin's head is wielded by Miles Standish, who was at that first Thanksgiving and became an American hero for defending the Plymouth Colony. But he also terrorized local natives. This is a part of the, the brutality that's being celebrated when they harken back to Miles Standish and and who he is and what he represents. Uh, he represents the death of native people. Um, he represents the threat of sword, the threat of arms. This is a, a flag that marks 
the oppression and subjugation of our people under the threat of violence. Now a handful of state lawmakers like Lindsay Sabadosa are pushing legislation to start a conversation about changing these symbols. We need to put together a commission really composed of native voices so that we can find a symbol that represents the values of Massachusetts that's true to our history but is also respectful at the same time. Dietz and Sabadosa both think momentum for change is building thanks in part to the intense conversations about race in the Trump era. I think that leads people to, to reflect more on their communities and what are the symbols and emblems that represent us and why do they represent us and is that who we want to be? For people who want to preserve the tradition and history in the flag, Harpin Dietz says there's a simple solution. If we could just simply change this flag from that sword to a tree which represents peace, maybe something about true peace and equality underneath it, we have a whole different meaning to the same symbolism. The movement for change is also taking hold at the local government level. Around 50 cities and towns across the state are considering local resolutions to support changing the flag. There's an event this weekend in San Diego to spotlight a global crisis. Each year, more than 800,000 children die from water-related diseases, according to Project Concern International. At the PCI Water Walk, participants will bring awareness to this issue by walking for three miles with five-gallon jugs balanced on their heads. Joining us now is Afamo Musa, one of the women who are participating in this weekend's event. Welcome. Thank you. So, Famo, can you tell us what does this event mean to you? Uh, to me, it's a way to contribute to, since I can't, I don't have the resources or the money to donate, I donate my time where, and then I go there, I talk about my experience doing work, working for water when I was, since I was five years old. So it's a way to pay, to, to pay back, I guess. So can you talk to me about the, the significance of the, the five gallon jugs being balanced on the participants' heads? So when you're walking for water, you have to work for eight miles, six miles, five miles. Sometimes the water closest to you gets shut off, so you have to find it elsewhere, and elsewhere is usually far away. So when you go there and you get your water, you don't want to be doing that over and over again. So you have to carry a lot of water that would be enough for your family for one trip. So you would be holding two gallons in your hands, one that's round that you could push, and then one on your head. The more you could carry, the more water you have, and then you wouldn't have to go back to go get more water, and then it will last longer. And I understand that you've been here in the States for about 10 years, mm -hmm. but 15. 15 years, excuse me. So prior to that, can you, can you talk about um, your experience before moving to San Diego? Before moving to San Diego, I lived in, in Kakuma refugee camp located in Kenya, where I wasn't allowed to go to school because I was a girl. So I, I, as, a young, as a young girl, I learned to do chores. I learned to cook, to go get water, to go get firewood, to help my younger sisters. We are five girls in the family, and I'm, I, was the, I'm, I am the second oldest. So I had to learn to help my mother take care of my younger sisters. So my reality was getting water and helping my mother take care of my younger sisters. So at five years old and you're traveling with the responsibility to bring back fresh water yes. to the family, what is this water used for? Just talk about the significance because maybe we don't even appreciate just the value. Water is used in daily basis. We use it to to bathe, we use it to cook, we use it to decorate the house because the house is made of wood and mud, so you need water f for you to have mud to, duck, to fix your house, basically. So it's necessity that's, that we use almost every day. So we use it for basically what we use it right now, but we, can't, we don't have the luxury of just turning on the tab. We have to go get it from somewhere else and then Think about the way you use it so you can have more, so it will last longer. And if yeah. not for this responsibility, um, what else would you be able to do? There's no many options, especially in the refugee camp where nobody asks you what do you want to be when you grow up. They already decided you, your role was already based on your gender. By the time, by the day you're born, they, you already know what you're going to be. You're going to be a caretaker, you're going to be a wife, and you're going to have kids. You have no other options. So 
you have you have no choice but to learn how to, to how to do chores and how to get water. So by participating this Sunday, what are you hoping to achieve? By participating, I'm hoping to achieve to to do the reach out so more people will show up. And then while, while we're doing Walk for Water, people would understand why they're doing Walk for Water, why they're walking for water, and what it, it signifies and what people are going through, and not to make it real for them, basically. And then for them to donate, it, once they donate, people could have water close to them so that they wouldn't have to walk eight miles to go get water, and then they would have more time to do other things. Even if they can't go to school, they, they might want to try to learn for themselves and do, do other things instead of focusing on just getting water that's far away. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And the 2019 Water Walk is this Sunday, April yes. 28th mm -hmm. at 9 a.m. at Tecolote Shores in Mission Bay, yes. San Diego. Mm -hmm. It's almost the weekend, but will this warm weather be sticking around? Meteorologist Dajia Swad has our forecast. As we continue through tonight, low clouds going to build on in for San Diego. Many coastal areas dropping down to 59 here in San Diego tonight. If you're out towards Oceanside in the lower 50s, also looking at clouds for you. We are under the influence of high pressure, but that high pressure will continue to weaken as we track out an upper level low that will press its way in as we head into next week. But as of now, just watching clouds near the coast as you head back into Borrego Springs, clear skies, low 67, 49 in Mount Laguna. Also not worried about cloudy conditions. Tomorrow, very warm as we head into the desert. It's going to feel comfortable at the coast. We'll top it off in the lower 70s for San Diego as well as Oceanside. Still going to be looking at cloudy skies at the coast and we'll continue to see those that cloud layer move into the valleys as well as we continue not only for Friday but into Saturday as well as Sunday. Borrego Springs, it is warm out there 99 degrees stay hydrated and don't forget the sunscreen 74 tomorrow's high in Mount Laguna and looking at sun and clouds mixing now this weekend still relatively warm and dry across the southwest uh, for as a whole but as we move into San Diego specifically especially near the coast we're going to notice temperatures cooling down slightly. So no longer in the 70s, going into the upper 60s for your highs, or rather going down into the upper 60s for your highs. Low clouds likely Saturday, and then we'll be looking at a better chance for some sunshine Sunday. But for Monday, that's when we track out our upper level low that will bring the chance for some shower activity at the coast, topping off at 67. Also going to see that same pattern inland. Noticing more clouds as we head into tomorrow and Saturday, topping off in the upper 70s, then only in the upper 60s as you head into Monday and Tuesday and a passing shower for Monday. If you're out to the deserts, well, it's going to remain pretty warm at least through Sunday. And then we'll be talking about the chance for some cooler air on your Monday with a high of only 79, so a big temperature change in towards the deserts as we head into the early week. Also notice that cool down into the mountains for the early week, topping off in the 50s. Reporting for KBBS News, I'm your meteorologist, Dodgy Swad, back to you. Warm weather means outdoor events like the popular Art Walk and Adams Avenue Unplugged. Or if you want to stay inside, there's a dance performance from some of the favorite classical ballets. KPBS arts editor Nina Guerin shows us what's coming up. If you're in the mood to buy art or just spend a day outside looking at it, head to Mission Federal Art Walk, a favorite San Diego arts festival. On display at this 35th annual event is everything from watercolor and oil paintings to photography and sculpture. There are booths set up along 16 blocks in Little Italy for you to discover new artists or check in with your favorites. The two-day event also has a popular Kids Walk event for families, four stages of music and spoken word, and my personal favorite, the Art Moves stage featuring ballet, hip-hop, and contemporary dance performances. Adams Avenue Unplugged is another popular arts festival, this one focusing on music throughout Normal Heights and Kensington. Oh, I went down, down, down into the way this event works is that musicians will perform at various venues along Adams Avenue, like Kensington Cafe, the Old Sod Lestats, and other neighborhood businesses. Artists range from folk favorite David Lindley and Latin singer Gabby Moreno to a variety of local singer-songwriters, country artists, and alternative bands. 
San Diego Ballet is known for putting on non-traditional ballet shows that mix jazz with dance, but for Romance on Point, it's all about the classics. For this program, you'll see excerpts from three beloved ballets, Romeo and Juliet, Don Quixote, and Giselle. Interpreted by Javier Velasco, the dances will focus on romance and the heart of each story. This is the kind of traditional ballet with point shoes and romantic tutus, perfect for both ballet lovers and new audiences too. For KPBS Arts, I'm Nina Guerin. Now here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS Newsroom. On Morning Edition, thousands of marijuana-related convictions could be getting dismissed. Which cases qualify? And on Midday Edition, Imperial Beach is moving closer to one of the strictest plastic bag bans in the state. Details on the mayor's proposal. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.